All right. We are live here on the HVAC School podcast live stream thingy. Uh, we have uh, three esteemed guests. Adam is a guest this week because he's so good at sheet metal. Mm -hmm. um, we got Adam and um, another esteemed guest, Neil Comparetto. Neil, do uh, you want to give us a little introduction to yourself? I think people are probably more familiar with Adam, but. Oh, so. Um, I don't know about that. <laughs> I am uh, one of the owners of the Comfort Squad. We are a uh, heating and air conditioning contractor in Central Virginia. We also do home performance. Um, uh, kind of been, uh, started in 2000. Um, for some reason, I'm botching this whole intro, and now I'm all of a sudden nervous hey, because man. the red light's on. But uh, but no, we are uh, it's residential. All good. We're not even live uh, right now. No. Yeah. <laughs> Hallelujah. No. I'm Neil. All right, Michael. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, Michael House, uh, Cincinnati, Ohio. Similar to Neil, we're residential. Uh, also do what we like to call high performance HVAC as well as um, home performance evaluations and advanced testing, that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, there's a uh, between the three of you guys, there's a lot of a lot of experience right here. And so what we're talking about tonight is sheet metal, working with sheet metal, um, I, I know for, for some people that's might be really unfamiliar and that's kind of where we want to start is just at the most basic level. Um, can, yeah, Neil, I know you said you brought some props. Can you, can you walk us through just like the basic, the basic tools that you use in sheet metal? Well, I guess you gotta, like, if you're installing ductwork or you're fabricating it. So my, my background's installing it. Um, we'll, we'll do some fabricating uh, in the field, but for the most part, it's, um, yeah. So I have most of that stuff with me. Uh, I'd say your, your go-to tools would be your, your hand seamers, your tongs. Uh, now see, yeah, <laughs> gotta get real close. Yeah, there you go. Uh, your, uh, your crimpers. Oh, there we go. Yeah, there we go. Uh, I got that blur thing on. Oh, that's uh, right. Crimpers. Your lefts. These would be my, you know, these kind of, uh, if you're right-handed, cut left. Um, use these for everything. I mean, my whole strategy is try to do less with more, like multi-taskers. So tongs are also hammers, um, you know things things of that nature but uh yeah like you have two tongs up here the offsets are great but um probably will stay in the truck um or you you know you'll pick one um typically yeah so yeah so i've almost never used the offset tongs i was like taught with just the old school straight ones and that's what i use for most everything and like neil said they're hammers you know you beat drives on duct with them and use them for everything yeah they'll last forever until you lose it in the attic so that is the, the <laughs> only time you ever need a new one is when you lose it in the attic insulation yeah it's it's surprisingly expensive all these tools like if you start adding them up one by one um, oh yeah but like i, but I think you can also do most everything with just the basic snips and a pair of tongs get you 95% of everything. Right. And folding um, bars. Those are like the most. Yeah. So um, the only thing we have that sheet metal, like a new install would be uh, a plenum for a unit. And so my background was we would just have a duck knife um, and I would actually, we would just use pliers instead of, um, we call them duck bills here. Um, no break, no nothing, just, just a pair of pliers and a, and a, and a duck knife. That's kind of like what I started with. And then, um, instead of crimpers, uh, I, I used to use like, um, needle nose right. pliers and you can just make a bend 
you know. Um, so I've yeah, because it, they are it really only expensive. takes three hundred times longer <laughs> to do it that way. <laughs> um, but I've slowly added, you know, like when I started out, I mean, yeah, it's just the cost of the, like you said, I mean, they can they they can add up fast. Um, so these things are like seventy five dollars each now. It's uh, yeah. or sixty to it's crazy. I wanted to uh, ask you guys something because I've seen, uh, you know, we just we got on crimpers for a second there. I've seen on the internet there's like uh, quite a few debates that go on. Do you have the, uh, you know, there's like three prongs on one side and two on the other. Do you have a preference which one way you have in or out? How do you uh, use your? I generally do three in and the two one out, but I think that's just what the tool feels better in my hand that way. I don't really care or think there's a right or a wrong way, but I could be wrong. I feel like I did hear or was listening maybe to a Craig Migliaccio thing that said a direction and I had like never even thought about it till then. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Adam, what about you? Are you, are, are you a like own all these kind of tools person or do you just take one or two things down? Yeah, uh, I that? try to like, so I used to have this huge, I mean, I still have the bag. I have this huge open veto bag where I have like every freaking hand tool you could possibly think of. And I used to carry it down, but I'm getting older and my back is hurting. So like now I'll take like a bucket and I'll throw like a couple things in the bucket and then just carry that down the stairs. Um, so yeah, I try to take as little as possible, but there is like, I know you guys were saying like offset seamers or tongs you don't use very frequently but i do find that like there's certain specialty tools that you don't use them every day but maybe once every six months or once a year it gets you out of a bind in a tight situation oh yeah like the right angle snips um they yeah rarely get used, to but, use, when you, but yeah when you need them <laughs> they're awesome yeah. so that's yeah you, yeah you gotta have them you know you build your your war chest of, um, and uh, <laughs> try to leave them in a band, yeah. but you got to have them. I mean, the, these uh, circle cutters are awesome too. If you're doing a lot of installs that are, well, we do more retrofits than full duct systems, but you know, if you're doing plenums and a lot of takeoffs, the, those circle cutters are also, you know, sort of expensive but they're worth it and they you know last forever you can replace the drill bits in them and yeah they sell a couple different sizes in those circle cutters one thing i did realize early on um, years ago when i bought it is they have like a little gauge on the circle cutter where you line up what size pipe you're what size hole you're cutting right and mm -hmm. the gauge is not super accurate so like I always set it with a with a tape measure and kind of ignore their gauge on the tool. Just a quick tip to anyone that's just trying to buy it for the first time using it. I sort of gauge it off of the first time I cut and sort of just find to no I know I have to set it like an eighth of an inch smaller than what I really want and that's a tight fit or uh, we also use a lot of the uh Air gasketed tight. like peel and stick ones that it doesn't matter how you know you've got inch and a half or two inches to play with on all sides so if you're too big it doesn't matter yeah yeah a lot of it depends on yeah like what what you're given to work with in terms of collars and all that stuff what the exact way you're going to use the tool is um so uh neil you were saying that you guys do quite a bit of like, I guess, fabrication in the field. What kind of stuff will you guys uh, actually fabricate? We'll do pretty much anything that's square. Um, like we'll in the field, if we have to, if um, things come together quickly and we don't have time to make it beforehand, but we'll sometimes even make it at the shop with like a four foot break. Um, so not, you know, it's a it's pretty simple uh, tool and you can get a lot done with that. Um, so like 
plenum boxes, uh, even elbows will make. And then I have um, like turning vein kit and you mm. could, you do quite a bit. Um, just radius, radius nineties are kind of uh, out of the question, even though I kind of have an idea on how to do that. I'm going to mess with it, but, um, but yeah, we'll do like uh, return boxes, uh, supply boxes and transitions, things like that. Um, there's also this, uh, I know we're not supposed to name brands, but this thing called the Hensler bender, I think it's called, it's basically like a three foot handheld brake that, um can you can do a lot with that too and uh just in general we try to go to off the shelf quickly um as far as like if we're doing a change out or, or we're doing a duck job uh so typically the, f- the only thing that gets fabricated are like return register boxes uh supply plenum return plenum and then it gets converted to hopefully round duct um but if not, um, you know, eight, eight by, you know, 24, 18, whatever off the um, stuff we can buy at the supply house. Yeah. Yeah. Um, any, any thoughts on that, Michael, Adam, what, what kind of stuff is, is maybe, you know, worth making in the field versus buying it off the shelf? I mean, I'm similar to Neil where we'll make, everything that's square if we need something radius which we uh typically know ahead of time and have a sheet metal shop make those um i just have like a cheap three foot harbor freight sheet metal break uh that we use along with uh just the hand benders like are on the screen and um just that's what we make everything with we're and same where we we're generally using you know stock plenums and we'll have to make transitions to like the size of filter rack we're going to or uh between an a coil and a furnace or those sorts of transitions or offsets that are uh you know pretty easy to make on site and uh you know because it's hard to know everything in advance and like it it takes me more time to sort of measure a job in a way that i would know exactly how i'm going to do everything than to just take some tools and metal there and do it yeah it's kind of my same mindset too. And I, I used to like to enjoy to like go, you know, cause I have a, a small sheet metal shop. You know, we, I, I have a box truck that we have like a per- portable Pittsburgh machine and a box and pan break on, but then like to make nineties and stuff like that, I'd make it at the shop. Um, and I used to love doing it, but I found a really good sheet metal shop. And like, I kind of gauge things on if I could make it faster, then like calling it in and picking up the order from them i'm just gonna do it you know what i mean like if i could make something in 45 minutes but it will take me an hour and a half to go get it i'll just make it you know um otherwise i'm just gonna have somebody else do it it's just easier gotcha yeah um so i guess uh, one thing all of that kind of has to be planned in advance right that you've got to carry a certain amount of metal with you to these to these jobs and things like that is is that kind of fair to say yeah we uh we get five foot by ten foot sheets of metal from our supply house and so that lasts you for a while or um simple jobs we have like a package that we order with our equipment or whatever that comes with it but Gotcha. Yeah, same um, thing. We'll we'll just bring metal and then S slip, which is um, uh, some people call it slides, uh, but that that just kind of helps you interlock the pieces together. We call them S cleats. We call them S locks. <laughs> <laughs> um. Uh, okay, so. 
so we got a question here uh, from Adrian Go Goins. Uh, are, are you making these out of one piece or several? Can you guys could, yeah? Can you just talk us through like, I don't know if there's Sheet a way. Metal to is typically multiple pieces, no matter what, except for like round pipe. But you know, even even ductwork comes in two sections that you put together. So typically, um, for me, like I said, we're typically doing small transition pieces. And in the field, it's easiest to do that in four separate pieces. And you can do one at a time and work your way around. Because it's harder to, in the field, without a sheet metal break, at least, on site, it's harder to make you know, more than a one or two inch bend on something. Gotcha. Um, so, so when you, when you're making something like that in the field, are you putting, uh, yeah, like you're using those S are you using S cleats and things like that to hold things together? Or are you just using screws? Like what's your, uh, we do a combination that? of both. Uh, so it sort of depends. I, when I'm making a transition, a lot of times I do, uh, you know, say we've got a duct here and a duct here and going in between, I'll put S cleats on this part, fold the sides and screw the sides together. A lot of people will, uh, put an S cleat on the side as well. I don't think there's right or wrong as long as it's sealed up. Gotcha. Yeah. Do you guys have any thoughts on that? Neil, Adam, uh, in terms of like screws versus the, the S cleats. I, I do S cleats and screws. We do. Um, and then tape. And then if it looks bad, we bubble wrap it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I use, uh, I have, like I said, I got a, portable pittsburgh machine so like all of the 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 vertical joints are all there's like a, a seam it makes like a little groove and you just kind of hammer it over um that's what we i just have it I, we've had it forever it's just mounted inside of our box truck so it's just easy to run the metal through to make the edge on it yeah adam's yeah. the actual real sheet metal mechanic. <laughs> yeah <laughs> We're hacks. We're just hacking. Yeah, we're, we're, <laughs> you should just listen to Adam. Yeah. <laughs> He's got a whole box. He rolls up with a box truck for on site sheet metal uh, modifications. So um, we got a question from this guy. Uh, never heard of him before. Uh, but he wants to know I, I guess maybe uh, like the, the gauge. The of gauge? Metal? Yeah. The gauge of metal. Well, we use, um, it, like, if it comes in a sheet, it's typically 26 gauge. Uh, but if we're um, buying it, usually it's 28. Um, I want to say 30 is... You can get 30, too. Yeah, but, it's but like I don't paper. even think it's code. Like, it's against code, but they still sell it. Um, but, yeah, if it round pipe up to a certain size, is for us, is 28. And then... Um, 26 in when it comes in sheets gotcha gauge. gotcha until you get to the real big fittings and then you go to 24 gauge um so this is another yeah. question and, kind of and on if it's like a vent like there's there's certain requirements for you know oven vents and stuff like that so it'll be different gauges depending on that um yeah so and this is a question kind of Kind of about, do, do, do you guys, when you're putting stuff I don't together, fool with math at all. I do it on site and just measure, the, like, if you're doing it in four pieces, all you need to do is know your height, put the piece of metal where it goes, put a couple marks on it, take it back down, draw some lines with that, and then, like, the only math involved is the height, so... Uh, yeah, so what, if that, you, that's like a squared around. That's um, it's one of the trickier things to do. Yeah. 
Um, I use, there's actually a book, if you guys could find it, if anyone, um, it's, uh, what is it called here? It's called the air conditioners cut or air conditioner cutters ready reference. It's just like an old school manual. I've lost one and then I bought another used one for like 10 bucks online or whatever, but they give you like all the, like how to make these fittings in that. Um, but um, yeah, you don't really need to know much. You just like, I always start with like, what is your flattest side or your straightest side, right? And then um, you can kind of do what Housh is saying. Otherwise, um, if you figure out what, how big your offset is, um, I, I'm probably gonna butcher how to say this or whatever, but you could use uh, back in the geometry days or whatever, the Pythagorean theorem to figure out the length of your angle on that. You don't really need to know like, 37 degree angle this or that you're basically figuring out triangles is what you're doing if you're using math right gotcha yeah that makes, that makes it's sense. by the time you do the math you could do my method <laughs> yeah yeah and so but you need the math or or either like for me if i'm me needing to measure something at that detail it's because i have to send it to get a drawing or whatever and then you can just sort of like my sheet metal guys i just give them the details so say it's like a two inch offset i say i need it to be you know this size by this size by this height with a two inch offset and they do the math for me you know i mean so I'm but I would. Uh, what's that? No, I, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I thought you were done. Um, I always thought that'd be a good tech tip on how to draw ductwork to send to like a sheet metal shop, because that's not something that everyone knows. And it's interesting too, is like there, um, there's like different languages. Um, like some people draw different, and it's, it's also interesting if you're, you know, some of the old school guys. Like now, you know, on my iPad, I draw it and email it, but they would just call it in and they would just rattle through like it's like its own language. As I was, you know, first time I heard someone doing it, I was like, what are you talking about? But um, it can be, you know, verbalized uh, like a, it, a fitting that's an offset that drops that it changes sizes. Um, so, Adam, Matt, you guys should, uh, should do a tech tip on that. Yeah, that, uh, that is. I was actually thinking about I, that. Huh? I I found it like I always used to call them in because the guys who make our sheet metal used to be part of our company. So I've like known them forever. Uh, now someone else owns that division or whatever, but we still use the sheet metal guys. And so I've always known the language. But then when I got into using SketchUp for stuff, it's really pretty quick and easy for me to make a fitting and uh like attach measurements and stuff to it and so same with like i have this template for a radius 90 that i can just mark my dimensions on send it to my sheet metal guys and so then the communication is really clear on what we need like yeah, this this guy doesn't do math but he'll draw a fitting and sketch up yeah and send it the 3d well, I version. know my point Just in I case do, you have a, i do yeah. math all the time my point in that case was that it generally takes more time to mm -hmm. do the math in the scenario of making a transition on site well um maybe someday we could race you know, you'd have a little yeah. competition, me and you. Let's do it. What are you doing tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so a, a lot of the, a lot of the metal that you can, or that I have used here in Texas has been, uh, interior lined metal. Um, what's most of this, what, what is the metal that, you guys are typically purchasing is it just sheet metal with no insulation on it how are you guys uh sort of tackling the the insulating part of it so we we stay away from that stuff um 
we don't use it at all. Um, if we do need to line it, like the lining is for sound really more than uh, insulating. We use um, foam, like um, elastomeric foam. But so, yeah, no, if we're purchasing metal, it's going to be um, unlined and we insulate on the outside. Uh, there's risk with lined ducts on the supply side to uh, to grow things like uh, microbial growth. Uh, just it's a it's like a magnet for mold food, and it's in a moist environment, and just typically things don't go well. Um, so we've removed quite a bit of that because of because of mold. And then and then you said you're doing you're doing foam on the outside. No, on the inside. So if we okay. do need to sound attenuate, we'll use um, duct liner, foam duct liner. So okay. um, they make you know, several different brands make it. And uh, you would use those stick pin like we do. I mean, um, the adhesive stick pins, you put, you'd lay that inside your duct then you'd spray an adhesive on the duct. Um, then you'd spray it on the foam, let it tack up put it on and then you put like these washers over the pins, cut them down if you've got the wrong size and it's pretty secure. Gotcha. Yeah. Michael, Adam, what Same. do you guys think? I mean, do? I steer clear of internally lined ducks. Uh, and it's in my area, at least it's less common except it, or it's more common in commercial than residential to have internally lined ducks but you know i understand like in texas you know you guys are generally putting stuff in attics and condensation is a concern and all that sort of stuff you know so there's differences in markets but yeah i have uh for the most part i've done jobs where you have small pieces of duct that are lined it's usually for sound um i didn't even know like foam stuff you know existed like neil was talking about to be honest um but i've always used like fiberglass uh wrap in the past i've just on the past maybe year tried bubble wrap a couple times but like i'm super skeptical on the r value on that like even if you do it correct i think correct, you divide you know? by four whatever it says yeah just like divide <laughs> by four so, um, but I have tried, I have actually done, uh, recently I did a job where we encapsulated the ductwork in closed cell foam, um, which that turned out pretty well. I probably, I think that was the best insulated job we've ever done. You know, duckboard is very good at insulating a uh, rectangular sheet metal duct. Hmm. It's good for it. Perfect application. <laughs> yeah um we do it right because we do it twice when you wrap it with duct board right there you is know? a point to be made of internally lined like if you were to insulate it really well internally your risk of condensation would be a lot lower um so i i, I get why it's done yeah um and in terms of, do you guys have any strategies for, I'm thinking particularly of uh, like round pipe wrapping that in insulation. Do you guys try to do that? Round let's say, pipe's let's easy to wrap. It's let's say, easiest. let's say you're doing, you're doing a, like a, like a big trunk line or something like that. Um, or you're going to wrap any kind of duct. Are you doing that beforehand? Are you putting it up first? Like what's kind of the, the process or the thinking um, when it comes to all of that? we always try to pre-wrap as much as possible and do like because typically for us if we're doing insulated duct that's in an attic or something and like tight to get to so you try to do as much as you can on a table somewhere before you take it up there is my preference at least one thing i found with uh with round pipe um i don't know if you're doing round pipe, if you guys use, I know some people just use duck wrap and they staple it or whatever, and then tape it. Other people use the, you know, the five foot sleeves. Um, what I've done is actually used, um, you know, buy a bag of flex 
and then you use the liner as like a guide and then you could pull long pieces you know 10 15 foot pieces of insulation uh all on at one piece uh, at one time and you don't have a seam then you know what i mean and they just pull the liner out yep yeah we it's actually i think it's cheaper if like i haven't since i moved to virginia i haven't seen the five foot sleeves right they come in a roll mm -hmm. uh haven't seen them but if flex is cheaper like a 25 foot of flex is cheaper than five five foot sleeves yeah it's crazy um, and then you just throw the the inner yeah the i mean all the the flex thing seems like it would work decent all the sleeves i've used were like such a pain in the butt i thought like i, I feel like it's easier and i've always just wrapped it with you know buy a roll of wrap cut your sections and doesn't take that long to wrap a section of pipe it's all the fittings and elbows that the flex thing would do a lot better or long sections but you typically have like takeoffs and all kinds of things happen and that it's just not real world to have long sections a lot of times that's not a hundred percent straightforward either because the in turn the, the flex insulation has a seam and you have to be mindful of where that seam is if that seams on the heel of an elbow it's just going to wide open up uh so it's not it yes if but you still have to think it through um you can't just uh pretend like you've pulled it over and it, it insulated it'll want to like adam adam made a great point you were used the the flex as like your your guide because it'll tear and um so typically what we do there is we we just use flex yeah <laughs> <laughs> you're like an artist with your flex like, in your jobs it's amazing <laughs> no but also another thing when you do that too when you um I find it compresses more the um, so say, you know, you have a rigid duct and you pull this flex liner over. So it depends on how um, critical that duct is to not s sweating. Um, so sometimes if it's uh, super critical, I, I won't even do that. We'll just wrap it um, for us that usually we're on um, condition space. So that'd be like a, a fresh air duct would be the most highest risk for us to condensate uh, in the winter. Gotcha. Um, yeah, that's so interesting. It's so interesting. You guys are talking about like, sometimes you don't even need to insulate your supply duct work. Is that, is that right? We, we use R1, like a bubble wrap basically in, in condition space. Yeah. And uh, that, so like if it's in a basement, yeah. Yeah, so returns we don't insulate at all in condition space. Um, I think that I'd always find that funny. That's like the air in that duct is the same temperature. I don't know, but when you see it, but maybe it's the bubble wrap, uh, the uh, the dazzle bubble wrap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we basically we don't insulate almost any unless it's out, you know, fresh air from outside or it's in an attic or unconditioned crawl space. Nothing gets insulated. Yeah, I feel like I'm Even on that now, line in Virginia. Like, you know, you start going south of here, it's definitely like one answer. Half the ducks in crawl spaces here aren't even insulated. Well, like, they're dehumidifying the crawl space. Yeah. Yeah. They're turning all, that vapor With all the liquid. condensation that yeah. thin drips back off. Yeah. But, um, yeah, so... So kind of along along that that point, um, the ducks are in the conditioned space. How much? How concerned are you guys with with air sealing? Um, so is that, we're, is that less we, of a factor? Yeah, in theory, uh, it is. But you still want the air to go where you want it to go. Um, you're probably not going to create a big pressure issue in the house. Meaning like if you're losing air to unconditioned space outside, you're going to create a pressure issue in the house. But if you're losing air to inside the house, um, that's that's less of an issue. But you're still putting air you paid to condition somewhere where you're 
not intending for it to go. So um, we still, we seal every duct like it's, like it's a water pipe, basically. We try to have zero leaks, no, regardless of where it is, but uh, it, it is less of an issue in condition space. Yeah, because here I, I, I try to go through and, um, you know, the, the prefabricated um, supply boots um, are not air sealed. So I'll air seal those and go through and do the 90s and everything like that. Uh, but again, yeah, all of our, I would say almost all of our ducks are in unconditioned spaces. So like the area that I work and live in, most houses are at least like a two floor house um, that uh, they, they have a basement, first floor, second floor, right? Some of them even have a third floor. And the biggest complaints are usually like a bedroom or something like that, you know, on the second or third floor or whatever, you don't have really good airflow. And in my experience, a lot of the older homes, 20, 30 year old homes, um, if you actually measure the total system airflow um, at the furnace or air handler, and then you go around and you measure the delivered airflow at the flow hood, um, I've usually seen somewhere between like a 30 to 40% duct loss. Um, so it's usually like a comfort thing, you know, and like where your pressures are the highest in the system is where you leak the most so if it's in a basement you know that's usually why basements are super cold in the summertime that's one of the reasons right um so yeah i think sealing the ductwork is huge i'm kind of curious to see how you guys seal it uh, mastic or tape what do you use i use like a belt, belt and suspenders right tape and mastic mm -hmm. yeah um we, you can do real, if you, if you take your time with tape, you can do a really good job. Um, but you're going to have to like squeegee it and just, you just have to, um, I, I think the, the key to duct sealing is like wanting to seal the duct. Like you can't pretend to do it. It's just not gonna, <laughs> it's just, it's not gonna work. Um, so you have to actually like be willing to sacrifice your hand and like, uh, you know, go for that tough, you know, it, you know, that it's like, man, I'm going to get cut if I go back there and seal this and you just got to do it. For you me, it's wanna... not getting cut. Typically. It's just that I end up with mastic like all over. So that's everything. why you work back to front, top yeah. to bottom. We have guys uh... easier said than done though. <laughs> <laughs> some, some people are just like mastic, uh, mastic magnets um that you're just born that way i think oh yeah, I, I think there's like an art actually to what i found because i've never used mastic before i mean for the longest time i learned sheet metal from like an 80 year old guy right and they didn't ever seal any duct work um so when we started getting hit you know by code officials for sealing duct work we were using tape and then when i started using mastic the first time it's like stuck on your arm hair and everything else you know and then i found that like you even need to pay attention to how you're applying the mastic onto the brush like how you're using the mastic in the bucket if you're trying to stay clean like all of that kind of yeah. matters you know and it's all like the the difficulty i have is that you're in a confined space and so i'll end up like backing into something that i just put mastic on or something <laughs> like that you know while i'm being like adam said i'm being real careful of how i use the mastic how i put it on top to bottom left to right whatever but then you turn around because somebody asks and you a question and you lean on the <laughs> piece of duck you just put mastic on. So your brand new hoodie. Never fails, but yeah. Um, all for the love of the trade, though. You know, that's I'll right. do it again tomorrow. Yep. Yeah. I ain't scared. Yeah. So I guess that kind of so one of the things that that we struggle with here is like. You're doing this in if you're doing a uh, you know a change out you've got you know six eight hours to do it and so you're putting mastic all over this thing and then you're trying to attach ducks um, to all of this so so what's your guys' process 
for that? How how are you? Where does the mastic go? Yeah, I do do everything first and mastic last is the way I would say. Yeah, or at least have the maybe not testing done, but at least have your metal stuff done, and then put mastic on it. But that's where I also like the tape and then mastic approach because you could get, you know, 80 to 90 percent of the way there with tape or whatever and then put mastic over top of it. You don't have to use quite as much mastic or as thick. And, um, you know, I find that works pretty well. Yeah, for us, it's like the end of the day, like if it's a multiple day job. Like you better be mastic in something at the end of the day. So you come back and it's hopefully dry uh, the next day. But yeah, there's nothing worse. It's like you see there's like you come to a job and there's 20 minutes of masticking that didn't get done. And now it's like you can't insulate or it's like. Yeah. The other good thing with mastic that I'll mention, and it's like much easier in today's day and age with battery powered fans, but, you know, have some air movement on it, especially like if you're doing stuff on a bench or like pre doing some of your fittings and stuff like that. If you have air movement on it, it helps to dry it much quicker than, uh, if it's just sitting there. We did yeah. this new construction crawl space job and I came back not weeks later and it was still wet. Uh because it was like winter time. Um it was a sealed crawl space too. So there wasn't any real air movement. The the vapor barrier wasn't down. And it was like weeks later, come back and it's still wet. It's like <laughs> I've had I've had some pretty good luck with uh, I don't know if you guys have used that hardcast tape. I think there's another brand too, but it's like the mastic tape. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, uh, that's one. Sorry, when I say tape, that's what we use. So we use a, a mastic tape. Um, just find it's a lot more durable than foil tape. Foil tape tends to just just rip. So with mastic tape, um, now. W- we kind of got a system down where we know where we need to use liquid mastic and where we need to use tape and we kind of do a hybrid approach. Um, but again, we're kind of like, we kind of take the duct sealing really seriously. So we go a little bit above and beyond, uh, you know, what has to, what, you know, needs to be done, but yeah, the mastic tape's great. It's, um, it's, it's very durable, uh, and uh we we prefer you know kind of our benchmark is it, it can we rip it right because if you can't rip it then you have to cut it and that's just slow so there's certain, like butyl tapes mostly are very hard to rip they're great but uh just not really practical to to use yeah scale. you want something you can tear with your teeth right no, th- that's that's option two uh <laughs> <laughs> preferably no teeth but if you have to that's that's the next step yeah um so an- another question from from brian since he's not here he's on an airplane um well yeah um can we talk a little bit about like cross breaks and uh, my sort of rule of thumb would be like if it's less than 12 inch tall fitting uh then i probably wouldn't bother cross breaking it like cross breaking uh however there is a tool now that someone makes that you could like roll on it and hand break it but in the field without a break it was always sort of hard to do or without a hensley bender yeah that's the the hill more yeah, and and and, and cross breaking is for is for sound dampening, right? It's it's because yeah, it's it's more rigid. It's, yeah, it's strength and... popping. It, it prevents the popping. Gotcha. Um, there's uh there's actually if you, uh, if you have a good if you have like a small duct system and low static pressure, the popping is 
not an issue. Yeah. So. I, it's, I was going to say, we, we don't do it all the time um, because just a lot of, yeah, the, the static pressure is pretty low. It's, it's, you're not really at tremendous risk on a fitting that's, you know, normal size. Now, if it starts yeah, getting really if you're big, talking something really long, then, but that's also where we would be in stock metal that already has a cross break built into it. Yeah, you can buy it with beads yeah. already in it on the yeah. metal built in every foot it has like a a, a rolled bead mm. there's actually a, i was trying to find it um i'm not having very good luck but uh smackna there's actually like a a standard for like what size duct you should be looking at to have a you know consider having a cross break for residential and it is and uh the gauge of the duct as well too it's kind of dictated by the the physical size of the duct. I think like that's I said, the bulk of what I do is making transitions between stuff that's going to have cross breaks on it. And so, like I said, my rule of thumb in that app. And so we're also talking typically, you know, 17 inches wide minimum. So which probably is close to some guideline or whatever anyway. So I just try to stick with, if it's more than 12 inches tall or, you know, I'll probably slide to 14, then I wouldn't bother with a cross break, but. Gotcha. Um, are there any other, uh, I guess like sound considerations when you're, when you have like a full sheet metal system? Yeah. Velocity. Oh. Um, and you can also have issues sometimes if you mount it, uh, like expansion and contraction problems, if it's mounted really rigidly against floor joists or something like that. Um, so it's often good to, you know, have it suspended an inch or so below anything. Yep. And like the, the branch runs they make these brackets. There's different style brackets you could use that kind of support the branch runs in the floor joists. And what I found is if you screw the the bracket to the duct, to the branch run, especially if you you have a, a gas furnace with higher temperatures in that, it kind of makes like a ticking noise as it's heating up and, and uh, cooling down in that. So like we never screw it any of it. We just lay it on top of it and it seems to be pretty quiet that way. Yeah. Um, Neil, did you want to, did you have a comment about velocity? Well, one thing too, is like, um, with, with rigid things, uh, vibration can be an issue. So we try to, uh, use a canvas connector in, in and out of a piece of equipment. So we kind of isolate the equipment and then the duct work, um, then you're kind of eliminating the equipment vibration from the ducts. Um, and then yeah, velocity, I want to off the top of my head, they say like, uh, <laughs> what's up, Steven, <laughs> I'm getting text. Uh, I'm getting cues, uh, of what to talk about. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, like 900 CFM I've heard, uh, read somewhere is like, kind of like the tipping point where, um, you start hearing air noise, but you know, turns, uh, turbulence, things like that create air noise also. So I mean, our, our great equalizer is flex duct to kind of, um, you know, we're, we're always mindful of air noise. So we want to keep the velocity in the ducts low. Um, so supply duct, uh, you know, I, I try to keep it at around 600, um, um, or even lower. Um, and then, you know, you gotta be mindful of, uh, all right, if it's a bedroom and you just don't want to do some crazy turns right before the boot and things like that, because it is absolutely a um, louder system than a flex and duckboard system. So if you're not taking extra measures. One other consideration, uh, especially like bedrooms in that is if you have like a trunk and branch system, if uh, you know, you have a trunk line with two branches coming off, if you have branches coming off right next to each other um you can get crosstalk um from you know 
rooms right next to each other. Mm-hmm. You can kind of hear through the ductwork. So yeah. it's always good to kind of stagger them a little bit. Yeah. I guess yeah, it's I just... think there's generally like regular, I don't know that regulations, the right word, uh, like recommendations or best practices to keep them a certain distance apart to avoid that because it is uh with a rigid duct system compared to something like flex or duct board um and that's why it's good to use sort of an approach like neil where you use both depending on where in the system kind of thing yeah yeah that makes sense um uh matt oh, l was just saying crosstalk affecting airflow no crosstalk meaning like hey if you have somebody in one bedroom talking having a conversation and let's say the equipment's off and then you have somebody in another bedroom sitting there you could potentially hear the conversation you could hear in between the rooms it kind of it's like oh and that's another little a tip for anyone new coming in if you're changing out a furnace that has a metal duct system and you're in a basement be careful what you say because it's like, <laughs> like a big speaker throughout the house. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. It just seems like something you need to be more aware of if you're doing like a full metal duct system is the potential for noise. Cause I just don't, I think with, with flex at, at least some kinds of noise, right? I mean, you can get a lot of like register, like return. You can still have noise problems with flex. Um, but kind of like echoing through a duct system, uh, um, that's just not really something we we deal with with like a full flex system. Um, so is there anything else that you guys wanted to wanted to hit on or wanted to make sure that we covered in this? Not personally. No? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> personally okay um you guys have any kind of closing 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 thoughts closing uh words of wisdom to leave people with don't do math kids <laughs> i would i would encourage people to uh to learn like as an installer to learn um some design so um or at least take like the manual d and then look up the the appendix with the equivalent lengths and just have an idea of what duct fittings are better than others um, where you can, cause a lot of times you'll, you'll have a decision, if, you know, a 90 boot or a straight boot, uh, you know, um, or, you know, straight boots, uh, a quarter of the uh, res- restriction than a 90 boot, um, uh, things like that. Uh, the, the duculator to have an idea on how to, how to use it where, you know, in the field and uh, a good application would be like, if say on the plans, it's a 12 inch duct, the 12 inch ducts, not going to fit 12 inch round. Well, we got to go rectangular. How do we do that? Where, you know, a duculator, you can convert it. Um, so just, just things like that, where, um, I found that when I started getting into, um, uh, some design work, things like that, I became a much better installer because of that. Yep. I, yeah. I completely agree with the, uh, the manual D thing and the fittings, like, cause I think, you know, some people are using fittings that are not even in, they don't have ratings for them. So it's always good to know what you're using. Um, and then another thing to kind of add to what you said about the duculator. Uh, one thing I didn't understand early on is like, you know, when you're, you're doing a job, you need to shrink down even a rectangle duct. They need to um, drop a ceiling in a basement or whatever else. Hey, can you save us an extra two inches? And you, you know, you take an eight inch tall duct and you try to drop it to six inch. Um, it doesn't always work out that, you know, you're just the looking area, at the, right? the area yeah. of the duct is not the same. The whole aspect ratio drastically. So two inches on the height might change it four or six inches on the length um, to move the same amount of airflow at the same friction rate. So it's super important to understand how to use a duculator. Yeah. yeah. I um, would also say like, don't, I, you know, I don't know if this is in the same vein or not, or has to do with sheet metal, but like the size of opening they give you on a furnace is not the right size for the application. So 
<laughs> put a box under it and things like that. I mean, so, uh, yeah. Um, to, to kind of, yeah, to Neil's point, Adam's point, um, you can make things better in the field. Like you have the opportunity as an installer, like, yeah, if you start to understand some of these things, you can actually make decisions that can be really beneficial. Um, in terms of, okay, which, you know, which way does this duck need to go? I have a decision. Is it, am I going to loop it around like this? And if you sort of understand kind of how things work, you can actually, you know, improve upon maybe even the design that you were given in some, in some, uh, situations. You know? Yeah. One of the most basic thing is the car analogy, like the ducks, a highway and you have cars driving through it. And if you kind of like think about it in that way, um, you know, it, it makes a lot of sense. Like the, the inside throat of an elbow, imagine if that was a street, you know, so that's an intersection. Um, you can't go full speed, uh, through that and make a right hand turn. But if it was a off ramp, you know, uh, a radius, you can. So it's like, um, it's, you know, that's kind of another way I kind of think about it in the field is like, how is that air, is the air going to be able to move easily um if it, if not then next step is like can okay can we have to do some funky stuff we don't want to do can we make the duck bigger because again if you're driving if you have to do a quick maneuvers in a car if you if you have a one lane that's hard if you have four lanes it's no big deal so just in, it's kind of how i think about it yep and you can kind of tie that in with velocity. If you're making a, a right-hand turn Steve. going 120 miles an hour in a car versus 45, yeah. you know, or whatever, it's a big difference. And about 120 is more fun. So there yeah. is that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't see that. I don't see that Mercedes getting 120. <laughs> that, that old uh, that tank yeah. you got. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of opportunity. I think sometimes we think that, you know, the, the, the design that we're given or whatever is like the people that put it together are, you know, magicians, but, um, we in the field actually have a, a big opportunity to understand these principles and put them into practice. And, and, you know, you, uh, there are so many situations where you have to be the one that decides how this thing's getting put together. And it's going to be there for 50 years. So it's good. Yeah, to I think it's, it's real easy to fall into like when you don't really know what you're trying to achieve or the goal is to like get this piece of equipment in. You're not thinking about, you know, some of the details or whatever. So knowing the end goal is always important. Yeah. Good stuff. Yeah. Uh, well, thanks for joining tonight, everybody, and uh, we will see you guys next week. Thank you so much, Neil, Michael, Adam, for uh, coming on as guests. We'll see you guys next time.